Karina Malloy is a former member of the Irish Army. Um, she joined up in 1988 and uh, she honourably discharged herself in February 2012. Karina is also a member of the Women of Honour group, which was set up um, during the Me Too um, hashtag movement, which was bringing up the issue of sexual abuse and misconduct in uh, the military. Um, she also has a book out. Uh, it's published by, it was written by Catherine Rogers in conjunction with Catherine Rogers. And it tells the story of her career throughout um, those years. And uh, it was very riveting reading. I only started reading it Saturday. I had it finished by, uh, by Saturday evening. But it took me Sunday and Monday to digest everything that was in this book. And um, for me, as a military enthusiast, as you know, I've been podcasting about military for the last three years. Um, sometimes, like I, I have complained before, that sometimes I'm a little la di da and everything is good about the military. Um, there is also the dark side. And throughout my own experiences in the FCA, Army Reserve, R RDF, uh, I found it a very positive experience. And it disturbs me to realise that those people out there who are not having uh, the kind of experience that I was having. And I'm always looking out to see, um, try to bridge the gap there and try to figure out uh, where am I at with this? What's the story with military? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Um, so where is it? So what's the big idea? What's the big idea? That's what I'm all about. Um, I want to uh, talk about the book. Um, I also want to relive my own experiences uh, in relation to it. The lessons that I learned, hopefully the lessons that the Irish Army will um, look into uh, going forward. So here we go. Um, before we start about uh, Karina's story, um, Let's take it right back to the very beginning. This is the centenary of the Irish Defence Forces. So the Irish Defence Forces, the Irish Army, was formed in 1923, I reckon. Um, it was made up of um, soldiers who fought in the Second World War, who came back and uh, fought in the uh, War of Independence. So you would be saying that it was majority um, pro-treaty. And on top of that, it was 100% male. And given the fact that most of those, um, the soldiers in the formation of the army served in the British army, it kind of stands to reason that uh, the British army was the model, is the model for the Irish Defence Forces and the Irish army in particular. And that organisation, when we look at it, um, was basically made of two uh, groups of men, right? You had the guys that did the job, the muscle. They were only allowed to think from the neck down. And the officers would be only allowed to think from the neck up. And... Over from 1923 all the way up to 1988, 50 years, you would have had the build up of that institution. Everybody in that organisation knew exactly what they were getting into, knew exactly how much the organisation could give to them and what they could get out of it. So as the time progressed, the men... Uh, for privates and uh, for privates, uh, three, two star and three star privates, uh, particularly in the west of Ireland, that meant that they would be able to get up super early in the morning, milk the cattle, uh, do the farm, look after their family, then skip into the barracks, start their day and at the end of the day, go home to their families, to the farm and get on with their business. And likewise, uh, for the officers, particularly in the West, um, they would start their day in the office, they would do their office work, 
and then at the end of the day they would go home to their families to their businesses uh, to whatever they got up to you know so for over the course of 50 years that was the institution and that was the way it worked and it worked like that um, the only real duties that the army had to take care of was the border issues which started up in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s, 90s and onwards and also uh, when they started um, overseas duties with the United Nations and that would have started in the um, 60s was it? Um, so again um, the guys that would apply for those uh, positions in the army um, for a start, the education wasn't too demanding. Their, their, their entry level requirements were not demanding. They were as such so that the privates do the manual stuff and the officers would get a little bit more training and do the, the, the heavy thinking stuff. And over the course of that, those two groups within the army would have solidified into tradition um, in, in, in the West, like I said before, it, it would have been more about family and keeping the other uh, keeping the other things going. But in the Eastern side, it was much more hardline uh, military and they really took their traditions seriously. And uh, I do, I have great experience from working with uh, Eastern Command units and yeah, they were very heavy into tradition and making sure that the army looked right and everything did right. Um, furthermore, for that organisation, uh, they were undermanned, they were under-resourced, uh, they didn't have the budget, the government did not have the money. Back then, like, the country was bankrupt, you know, we, we didn't, we, we couldn't start drawing down any serious money until after Eamon de Vila retired. Um, then we joined the EU and then we started getting our act together. But from those times, the army was working with practically nothing and they got away. They got they could only do what they could do by scrounging and um, working hard at it. And I'll come to that later. So. Back in 1988, Karina's story starts because at the time, uh, the Irish army decided to start taking on females into the army. Um, even Karina admits it in her, herself, like the army was uh, kind of had second thoughts about it. Um, and I, I would, if, if we looked into it, I, I can imagine it was a political decision and it was hastily done because um, from the very start, like, um, they went in as non-combatants uh, as part of a group and by the end of their uh, training that particular group was disbanded and they became part of the army and it was kind of confusing for the girls because they thought that um, y you know um, they were joining a particular group and by the end of it that group was completely disbanded and they were uh, on their own. Secondly um, Karina pointed out in the book that the weapon was too large. Uh, the, the the FN the, we were working with the FN at the time. It was a, a very sturdy weapon, uh, but it was built for a man. Uh, the equipment as well. It was all men equipment. Uh, pattern fifty eight nineteen fifty eight men. I I actually wore that webbing. Um, it's basically belts and metal buckles and straps. Um, I suppose they were more fitted used for they were designed for a man's uh, physique more than a woman's so then of course when you pull down the straps and clip up the buckles they'd only go so far and what had happened at the end was you'd have this little um bag there's little bag sitting where it's supposed to be sitting in the small of your back but it was actually banging against your bum if you're too small like you know it was going to cause issues uh, furthermore as well they simply didn't have the uniform because the uniform only went to a size small in a male so straight away um Karina uh, she pointed out that the army was very very ill prepared for it and 
um, we later discover Karina was also a quartermaster sergeant. So she would have, um, she would realise that all those uh, issues would have been uh, taken note of and sent up to army headquarters and they would have to work on it because as a result of that female, all female uh, um, platoon that was trained up, it took nearly 10 years uh, for the Irish army to start recruiting females again. And the reason I see, uh, as far as I can see, the reason for that was simply because the FN had to be um, taken out of service and the Star AUG was introduced, which is a much lighter weapon and it's better suited uh, for smaller hands. Um, also, the Pattern 50, or the, yeah, the Pattern 58 uh, weapon was replaced by Pattern 72, which was a little more uh, forgiving. Um, it was uh, plastic buckles and the straps might have been a bit longer and it worked out better because it wouldn't be so so many issues on the female body. And on top of that, we had the introduction of the DPM um, uniform, which is much lighter and it's much easier to, to manage because it's got drawstrings so you can draw it around your waist or the trousers, there's a drawstring on that so it'll tighten. So it's very easy to, it's a very forgiving kind of uniform that goes with it. So um, her first experience in the army was pretty much, um, she they were obviously the guinea pigs and um, um, and again, furthermore, from the army point of view, um, they obviously weren't thinking it through because um, they realized because as soon as they uh, qualified their army. So those women, there was about 38 of them. They went on to be have careers in uh, the army. Uh, furthermore, just a little bit background on Karina as well. Um, she applied. No, I won't talk about that yet because there's more about this. OK, so. Over the course uh, w when she applied, um, she went on and she uh, found herself doing um, duties in Eastern Command. Um, and that's where the problems started to arise. She was getting microaggression from uh, her seniors. And um, when she uh, when she went for courses, uh, the males were were very unforgiving towards her. They seemed to want her out of their organization. Um, there was nasty um, notes being sent to her, um, you know, um, microaggressive kind of stuff that made her feel unwelcome in that organization. And as a consequence of that, um, she found it very difficult. Be that as it may, her original idea was to join the army and become a PTI instructor. Um, throughout her time, she actually tried the selection course. She was the one. She was the first woman to try the Army Ranger Wing selection course. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, she didn't make it through it. Um, she did actually go ahead and get the PTI instructors course in it, but she didn't seem to be very satisfied with it. And furthermore, when she went to over overseas, um, you know, she found it difficult in her role. As um, w when she later became a, a quartermaster, um, her role was such that um, it, she found it difficult in that she would be just one female and hundreds of males working around her. And she wasn't comfortable with that uh, as well. Um, coming close to the end, she finally, um, her health was, was getting to her um, over the course of the many years of harassment and aggression towards her uh, she felt that she had to quit and from that point on when the me too movement started up she hooked up with the the other girls and um, she was able to broadcast her story and that that group now has taken a life of its own and we will see how far it's going to go so my next question my view on it um my views on the book firstly um, she's a Donegal girl and she was advised to join the Eastern Command. Now, she, she's in Donegal, like Ballyshannon is only just down the road. Uh, Rock Hill House as well is only just up the road in the Glenties. 
uh, but she ended up going to the Eastern Command. Uh, the advice being that if she, the closer she was to headquarters, the more chances she was going to get the opportunity to go to PTI. Um, her first decision to go to Eastern Command straight away, um, it, had she been in Donegal, she'd have been um, among her own and they would have looked after her. That's all I'll say about that. Uh, because she was in Eastern Command, her lovely Donegal voice uh, would have been lost in in Dublin um, because those guys traditional you know they wanted Dublin people to be working in Dublin in, in Eastern Command in Dublin right or, or the environments of the East you know um, she would have fit in better had she been from the East and um, just getting from that like the guys that would have been in Eastern Command if you know they'd be looking for issues in Eastern Command, and if something is off, in any way, shape, or form, they complain about it. And I can only imagine the amount of complaints that will be coming in, because uh, even in the Eastern Command, like they march slightly different from the way the rest of us do. They 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 wear their bar berries slightly different from the Western Command and the Southern Command as well. Like so, you would have there would have been a lot of aggression there. Like, like it had been under the surface kind of stuff. Um, yeah, she her, her expectations. Um, she went into this uh, with ideas of her own, ideals of her own. She had her own dreams. We all do. Unfortunately, the army is under resourced, undermanned, or uh, under budget. You, you know, everybody is competing for the same things. And so when she found herself doing the PTI instructor's course uh, and thinking, you know, she didn't get, she felt that she wasn't the best at it and that she was lagging behind and all of it because her dreams of becoming a PTI instructor, like, for example, like when I think about the times I was running through the forest with a big knife and, and, and a lot of soldiers chasing after me, I didn't exactly feel like I was Rambo. You know, just because I was, I found myself in the A team, the A section, I didn't feel like Hannibal Smith or Murdoch or Face or whoever, you know, you know, the dreams are totally different from the reality. The reality takes a whole new side to things. All right. Um, and my, what I'm trying to say is her dream to be a PTI instructor uh, was marred. She, she was unsatisfied with it because it was nothing like her own expectations and um, the big thing I get from that is you don't go into that or any organization with your own expectations because that leads to depression okay um, sensitivity she felt that she couldn't fit in was well, straight away because she was female in an all-male environment she, you know the natural fear of you know, being slightly different from every, being different from everybody else, like it, 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 it's a, it works against you. So when the lads go out for a pint, um, she's not having it. You know, uh, she even talks about when she went overseas, she was always big into going to the hotels and uh, going for a swim in the hotels and um, staying away from the group because. Um, I, I'm guilty of it myself like you know whenever I finish my duties in, in Longford or Mullingar the first thing I do is go straight out the gate and go downtown to a, um, a Chinese takeaway or get some nice food or even just go out um, um, that's not on when you're in an organisation it's very important to get stuck in and get involved with the people that you're working with otherwise there's that disconnect and before you know it, um, you know, it's a lonely lifestyle. And in the army, it's especially lonely if you're not uh, fitting in. Um, she's, um, she didn't have her blinkers on. Um, what do I mean by that? She was, um, she, how do I, how do I explain that? She doesn't have her blinkers on. Um, she's sensitive. Yeah, that's what that's what I was trying to say. She was sensitive. You see, the the gov the organization, the army, 
has its own values, its own principles, its own ideas and how things are done. And when you're given an order, you just do it. You don't think about the consequences. You don't think about, uh, is there a better way of doing this? You don't think about, um, where is this going to end up? You're given an order. You just carry it through. And of course, um, if you're anyways sensitive, um, they're, they're always chowing down on you for not following orders, or for talking back or questioning orders. There's none of that in the army. So you have to literally do as you're told. And by having the blinkers on, just focus on your orders and everything else. It, it can be just pure chaos. Just focus on your orders. Because if you don't, uh, what will happen is, is that if you're acting outside your orders or if you're acting outside the values and the principles of the organization, what will happen is you become liable. People pick on you because you're working outside the organization. So the trick is, is to stay in the organization and stay happy just to follow the orders and don't think about them. Um, the dream. I did talk about the dream. So what I found, uh, the lessons that I learned from um, Karina and her career is um, you have to be thick skinned. You have to realise that the army isn't the solution to everything. Every organisation has its limitations. You, you know, it can't do everything. So uh, when you see the issues that are there, you just have to get on with it. And you just move on and you just say to yourself, well, maybe in 20 or 30 years time, it'll sort itself out. Um, you have to be... Um, you have the blinker um, principle. You have to stop focusing on all the other issues. Um, I suppose when I think about this podcast, I've been doing it for so long. I've covered so many different topics. And now I kind of get, uh, sometimes I get a bit floundered thinking about all the things I should be doing, but I can't. So uh, again, you have to be, you have to have the blinkers on and ignore a lot of the things that can't be done. And just get on with the stuff that you can do. Uh, and finally, um, when you're in an organisation like the army, uh, your ideas, your ideals, your dreams are irrelevant. You know, there's a time and a place to dream your dreams. There's a time and a place to share your ideas. But the army is just not one of those places. Um, you're basically there to do a job. And anything more than that, if, if you can get any little pleasure out of doing the work, take great pleasure in those small things, because overall, it's a big disappointment. So you just keep the head down and you just say to yourself, I can only do my little bit and nothing more. There's nothing more I can do about that. And that's how the army works. So um, also on top of that, in terms of teamwork, if you find pe you're working with people who are a little bit sensitive or down about it. Um, Karina has a term for it, heat seekers. They're attention seekers. They, they're, they're drawing attention onto themselves. And to be able to spot those people, um, I, I totally advise reading the book because um, you can see straight away the consequences of people who are not uh, fitting in into an organisation. And it's just those three principles, being thick, ignorant and stupid. A little bit of that, uh, if you'd be happy. But if you're not happy, you either leave the organisation or you go off and you, you find time to do your own thing. Um, reaching your ceiling as well. Again, if you're in an organisation and you're just not happy with it, it's probably because you've reached your ceiling. That doesn't mean that there's somebody keeping you down. It just means that you do not, uh, you're not suitable to progress to the next level. And what I mean by that, my last podcast about uh, 71, um, you know, uh, the, the British uh, intelligence uh, officer, he's a cold, intelligent person. He will simply not be able to work in um in a, a highly uh, emotionally intelligent type position it'll never work for him 
you know, no matter how much training he gets, no matter how much effort he puts into it, he might, but he won't be happy in it. He's better off in the job that he's suited for. Um, so, uh, um, so that's what I, I say. Once you reach your ceiling, realize, can, you firstly you ask yourself, can I go that little bit higher? What's stopping me from getting that little bit higher? And once you realize that you've reached your ceiling, you've reached your ceiling. So you either stay in the organization and stay in that position or you just move on to some other organization. Um, what else can I say from that? Um, Karina, at the end of it, um, the, the message that the women of honor are putting out is that they want the army to apologize, to acknowledge and to be accountable. There's a fourth A, I can't remember it. Forgive me. But um, when I think about it, the army will not apologize or acknowledge. Uh, they might be able to account for their actions, but it's, you know, it'll be interesting to see how it pulls out. Because from a legal point of view, like um, getting the army to apologize for harassment, if they were to succeed in that, Everybody who's been in the organization for the last 50 years will be claiming some sort of compensation out of that. Um, acknowledgement. Uh, the organization, as the army as an organization, if they were to acknowledge that straight away, they'd make themselves legally liable. Um, so I would imagine that um, it would have to be direct actions on the actual persons that were doing the harassment and whatever. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, I, I, um, when I think about it, and accountability as well, um, the way I see it in terms of accountability, you have the person giving the order, you have the person executing the order, and for accountability, you'll have to have a third person in that um, organisation to do the recording of that. And, of course, that would slow the whole organisation down in terms of... Um, People would have to be reviewed all the time. There'd have to be a lot of vetting done to see people who qualified to be um, monitoring and keeping on top of things. So that would require a significant amount of resources, manpower, technology. Um, do we have that? I'm sure we'll have something in the, in the future. However, um, the way th things are going, uh, the defence forces are getting smaller and smaller and smaller on account of the fact that... Um, it's more technologically minded. Uh, it's more uh, about technology and the the um, the use of that technology. And going forward with all the compensation claims over the last 20, 30, 40 years, you had the deafness, you had the um, um, uh, personal injuries as well. Um, there were so many other compensation issues. I think... Uh, the government would be looking to keep the organization as small as humanly possible. And again, I think, uh, yeah, it mentioned later on in the book that uh, the Department of Defense has one of the highest levels of complaints going in any department. So um, I have no solution. We're just going to have to see how that pans out over the next few years. Um so far, what the army has done is they've come out with a statement of intent. Um, they're under a government review and they've got this hashtag. It stops here now. It stops here. All right. Um, that's just stage one. It'll be interesting to follow that as time goes on. Um, something else that, that uh, took my interest was um, she was serving in, in, in Serbia. And uh, they were operating in a NATO base. And um, just one of the policies, the security policies, the American policy, according to the book, was basically that um, if there's an issue, you shoot the leaders first and then you negotiate with the followers afterwards. Um, uh, and that might be fine for the, the Americans and the British and the French, but for the Irish... It, it, they, they have another way of doing things uh, from my point of view uh, the Irish policy of engaging with the enemy is it's a long game and we see it in um, we, we see it in the Lebanon 
in how they police uh, the blue line. It's peace enforcement. It's about um, not killing anybody. It's about trying to... Uh, you're playing the long game. You're basically um, policing the area and stopping them from get, getting too atrocious uh, so that... I, I said it in previous uh, podcasts that you will it'll be a cold day in hell before you'd get a militant um, hardliner to apologise to his victims and to, to give up uh, the fight. Um, for a first generation hardliner, yes. It's the third or the fourth generation hardliner. You might get them to see sense. Um, you might, by, by policing those blue lines... You're uh, allowing them to be violent, but not to the excess of murder and or at least trying to stop them from the excess of murder. Because at some point in the future of that nation, they're going to realise that they were just blind, stupid hatred, blind stupidity. The wheel of violence has to stop. And the blue line is basically to slow down that wheel of violence slow it down long enough so that people can get on with their lives and realise that it's pure evil that's being spread and that it has to be dealt with. Um, so that's what I got from the book. It's a very, very interesting read. Um, never mind just for the army. There's sexual harassment and discrimination in lots of different organisations. And um, it's a good page turner. And it, again, it takes... Uh, an organization, a military organization, uh, it takes that kind of organization to bring up all the different evils that can be found in any organization. Um, like I said before, harassment happens in any organization. Um, by seeing it in the extreme form uh, in the military, you can start identifying that in our own organizations. That's all I have to say. Take care and happy Christmas.